Harry's Wife Part 88.3 The Devaluation of Prince Harry In Section 2 of Part 88, I explain to you the nature of the dynamic that occurs between the narcissist and the intimate partner primary source. Harry is the intimate partner primary source to Harry's wife, as he is her spouse. This dynamic always, I repeat, always, involves what is known as the sustained devaluation. This is where the narcissist's behaviour, in effect, turns sour towards that IPPS. The manifestation of this varies considerably, dependent upon factors such as the subschool of narcissists that the victim is dealing with, whether that narcissist operates a facade, other goings-on within the fuel matrix. And it covers a huge range of manipulations, from being given a silent treatment in person, not responding to messages, being on the receiving end of physical or sexual violence, being insulted, subjected to cross-examination, circular conversations, word salads, shouting, argumentativeness, infidelity, the list is long and plentiful. And those of you who have been ensnared by narcissists will be familiar with many of the different manipulations of a malign nature that are doled out against you. Some of the manipulations are blatant, rudimentary and obvious. Others are far more subtle, taking the form of backhanded compliments, subtle put-downs, appearing to have your interests at heart when actually we're not. And Prince Harry finds himself in the sustained devaluation, where he will be experiencing a range of behaviours which are unconsciously and inherently designed to keep him under control, to draw fuel from him, to continue to acquire character traits and residual benefits from him, but in effect is a form of unconscious punishment. There will of course be times where a narcissist knows that they are not speaking to somebody because they believe that that person has done them some kind of ill. So they know that they're not talking to them and they know the reason in their mind why they're not doing it, but they don't know that they're doing it for fuel control, character traits or residual benefits. The narcissism doesn't allow them to know that. And in some instances, the narcissism utilises the truth as understood by everybody else. More often, a half-truth or nowhere near the truth as the motivation for the narcissist to take those steps. So, for instance, the narcissist isn't talking to the victim because they believe that the victim keeps nagging them. That hasn't actually happened, but the narcissism has rewritten history to compel the narcissist to believe that to be the case so that the narcissist ignores that person promptly and with a valid justification from the perspective of the narcissist. Prince Harry is being devalued. Some of the devaluing behaviour we are not privy to because it will take place behind the closed doors of the mansion at Monte Shitcho, in hotel rooms and other places where the two of them are in private. False accusations being cold-shouldered, accusations coming out of nowhere, triangulation by way of comparison with other people and with objects, not speaking to him, possibly shouting at him, However, there are other devaluing behaviours which can actually be seen in the public interaction. Now, you might think to yourself, well, why is that being done when she operates with a facade? Well, the reason is that the facade is important. But remember, some of the behaviours are done which can maintain the facade whilst assert control over Harry by devaluing him. And he might not even realise that he's been devalued, and indeed many of the observers don't see it as devaluing behaviour, yet it is. He, for instance, might just think, well, she's the star of the show, I don't mind playing second fiddle, not realising that her sense of entitlement drives her to do that, to relegate him into second position, to put her interests behind his, and he just goes along with it because he thinks, well, what, what Harry's wife wants, Harry's wife gets. And he has fallen into that mindset, driven by his failure to realise what he's with, and of course, 
the corrupting presence of his own emotional thinking. An article that comes from news.com.au from Daniela Elsa highlights lots of incidences where this sustained devaluation is actually apparent in the day-to-day -day activity between Harry's wife and Harry, although, of course, most people don't see it as devaluing behaviours because they are not aware that he's interacting with the narcissist. The article identifies a whole range of differing behaviours and is quite a useful summary of these devaluing behaviours, but they're still not seen as such. You, on the other hand, my dear viewers, have the advantage of listening to me explaining all these devaluing behaviours through the lens of narcissism for you. The article commences by explaining that raw precedence in the most literal sense can be a confusing thing. When Kate Middleton was preparing to become a bona fide duchess, she had to learn precisely the difference between the occasions in which she was obliged to curtsy to, say, Princess Beatrice, and those when they would have to bob demurely in front of her. Lady Diana Spencer was shown failing to navigate the arcane complexities of who comes before whom in Season 4 of The Crown, with Helena Bonham Carter's Princess Margaret imperiously directing the Bambi-like bride with a cutting wave of her cigarette and whiskey glass about how to reverently genuflect. Although, given that Diana was born on a royal estate and had grown up around the Windsors, likely this is an entirely fanciful scene. The point is, it's tough, especially for us mere mortals, who have not grown up in the coddled confines of palace life, to not run afoul of entrenched practice. Which might explain a particular royal blunder which has come to light. Earlier this month, Harry and Harry's wife, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, were in New York for the Salute to Freedom Gala, where the former army captain was handing out medals to veterans for what was their first red carpet appearance since they officially flounced out of royal life. When the couple arrived at the event, he was wearing his military medals and his knight commander of Royal Victorian Order Cross, whilst Harry's wife had chosen a voluminous attention-grabbing red Carolina Herrera frock, which boasted a sort of sartorial Isha sketch of layers. However, things took a turn when they entered the ballroom. In videos posted on social media, the Sussexes are shown entering under a sign that features her name and title first. Leaving aside any finickety issues about the fact that customary male titles come first, I know, I know it makes my feminist self want to rage, writes the author, but what was eyebrow-raising here is that was Harry, who is a decorated veteran who served two terms in Afghanistan, and it was in that capacity that he was there to hand out awards. This we could chalk to Americans being Americans, a nation who often seems to have exclusively acquired their knowledge of all things royal via Downton Abbey reruns, if it didn't highlight a bigger point, which is, Harry seems to be shrinking from view. And this observation about him shrinking from view is commensurate with the sustained devaluation. Earlier this month, his appearance at the rewired conference was largely overshadowed by Harry's wife speaking at the New York Times Deal Book Summit. She comes first, sense of entitlement, lack of emotional empathy. It was Harry's wife who popped up on Ellen DeGeneres' eponymous chat show last week for a cheesy I'm So Relatable interview, during which she took part in a skit eating like a chipmunk and drinking out of a baby's bottle. Mortifying, yes, but she has a very long way to go to come anywhere near the epically humiliating efforts of It's a Royal Knockout. Likewise, it has Los Angeles native who has been ruffling feathers in Washington and London with her recent cold calls to US senators over paid parental leave, and it is she who will reportedly fly to the capital in the coming weeks for a dinner with a bipartisan group of female pollies to press the point. It is the former suit star around whom there is increasing noise about whether she might be contemplating some sort of political run. One option would be for her to make a play for Diana Fenstein's Senate seat if the, by then, 90-year-old decides not to run in 2024. Whatever happened to what used to be the Sussex's patented double act, asks the article. Even before their wedding in 2018, Harry and Harry's wife presented a near-permanent unified front to the world, and they became a duo who seemed charmingly glued to one another physically. In March last year, when they returned to London for their final series of official outings as working members of the royal family, they fronted up as an indivisible unit, he glowering at times, her with a perma-smile in Richter's place. 
However, that united image seems to have started to slip. Pausing there, of course, hitherto, Harry would find himself in the Golden Period. And therefore, as a consequence of this, he was being treated in a benign fashion. So it would be a united front. It would be the simpering staring that we saw in the engagement interview, the compliments, etc. But, as it became the case that his fuel became stale, or wasn't being provided in such large amounts, and as frequently as it should be, not that Harry's wife knows this, but her narcissism unconsciously picks upon this, and therefore unconsciously punishes Harry for his failings, because those failings amount to a threat to control. He's not jettisoned because he still serves a purpose, as I've explained in parts passing, with regard to what the future holds for these two. And he isn't jettisoned because one of the disengagement triggers has not yet been activated. But at that juncture, the unified front that Daniela Elsner identifies arose as a consequence of the fact that he was painted white, there was a united front, or was rose in the garden. It was a golden period. And then it has altered because of the sustained devaluation. Returning to the article, what news of their Oprah Winfrey interview was revealed in late February, it emerged that the first section of the special would just be the Duchess and the talk show Titan talking adieu before Harry would join the pair. Sense of entitlement, assertion of control, lack of emotional empathy, lack of accountability for behaviour, manipulation by triangulation by excluding him. Lucky him being allowed to be what looks suspiciously like a second string player in this momentous moment for his family. In August, to celebrate Harry's wife's 40th birthday, she launched an initiative called 40 by 40, with a playful video starring Melissa McCarthy. All we saw of Harry was him juggling out the window for the briefest of moments. Again, this has been talked about in parts passing, but is another evidence of the devaluing behaviour. Her front and centre, him the clown, joker, outside juggling. And while the couple has a clutch of lawsuits ticking away, it is the Los Angeles native's case against the Mail on Sunday's parent company, Associated Newspapers Limited, over their publication of a letter she had sent her estranged father, which has become a legal millstone, though obviously through no fault of her own. Lord Justice Warby found for her in a summary judgment handed down in February. However, NL is currently fighting to appeal. Earlier this month, Harry's wife was forced to apologise for unintentionally misleading the court, after having forgotten that she had authorised an aide to brief the authors of what would become the fawning Sussex biography, Finding Dollars, excuse me, Funding Freedom, no, Finding Freedom. All roads now seem to lead to Harry's wife, and indeed they do, because... As a consequence of the conscious PR positioning from the agencies that have been instructed and her own unconscious narcissism, it has to have her front and centre. She was content, because her narcissism was content, to allow Harry to be front and centre or at least alongside her during seduction. But now, because he's in the sustained devaluation, leaving aside the personal devaluations that occur behind closed doors... There is this ongoing devaluation whereby he is relegated to the second string, which is how she actually sees him. Unconsciously, she doesn't see him as important. He is just a means to an end, although she would never acknowledge that because her narcissism will not let her. But again and again, he is finding himself in the role of spare once again. He was spare to the throne of the United Kingdom, and he's essentially the spare in the relationship. She's the important one. Returning to the article, the question here is, has Harry become something of a possible very willing and very happy adjunct in terms of his public visibility to his wife? Speculation they might be filming some sort of docu-series for special for the, for the Netflix Lords and Masters got a serious boost after a videographer reportedly trailed the couple when they descended on New York for a whirlwind frenzy of meetings in September. And the Daily Mail published images showing what appeared to be a camera crew travelling with them when they were back in the Big Apple for the intrepid gala. If this is the case, just who do you think would be more charismatic and engaging TV lead? The person who struggles with the limelight are well documented, or the person with a decade plus worth of experience in front of the cameras? Let me make plain at this point 
that there is absolutely nothing wrong with a woman making noise or waves or whatever the dickens she fancies. Anyone who dares to use the deeply misogynist expression about her wearing the pants in their relationship will have to answer to me in my hardback copy of The Second Sex. However, it does seem to be increasingly apparent that the dynamic which characterised their years as working HRHs, them as a buy one, get one free inseparable duo, could be shifting with the Duchess of Sussex coming to the solo four. And if some sort of run for political office is a future, then we could see this trend become even more pronounced. In all of this, it would be far from surprising if this is exactly what Harry wants and yearns for. Actually, he won't. But he's conned into that through the manipulative behaviour of his wife and his own emotional thinking, causing him to believe, yes, you go front and centre. I don't mind being the support act. You're the important one. That's okay. In instances, he will do that just to avoid another ear bashing and a tongue lashing. And in other instances, he's conned into believing that's the appropriate way by his emotional thinking. The article continues, having been unabashedly about, open about his feelings about the press and life and the spotlight, the prospect of melting a tad into the background to focus on his work, family and tending to the family's now globally famous chickens, would be entirely understandable. He doesn't have a choice. It's what she wants, not what he wants. And that may well coincide with him thinking, actually, I don't really mind this so much. It's not as if you had a chance, Harry. This was always on the cards that you were going to be relegated to second position. It's not because she thinks, oh, he doesn't mind, and that's okay. She doesn't give two figs about what he wants. And if it just so happens that he doesn't mind, well, so be it. It makes him easier to control, because he's not going to rail against this relegation. Returning to the article, if that is what he wants after the trauma and ructions of his life, then more power to him. Get that man a Kathmandu fleece and access to the golf channel, Dad Dom calls. Still, that wouldn't change the fact that Team Sussex looks increasingly like it is becoming Team Harry's wife. Behind every great man there's a woman, or so the hideously outdated saying goes. In 2022, it's looking a lot like the more appropriate version would be behind every great woman is a happy husband. And of course, we know that's not the case. We know from parts past him that Harry will be far from happy. He'll be told that he's been happy. He's been told that he loves it in California. But what this article does, without realising it, it points out the continued sustained devaluation of Harry by Harry's wife putting herself front and centre, by Harry being relegated to a bit part player, a support act, which is what the narcissist will invariably always do because we have to be the centre of everything. In order to assert control over the myriad of individuals dependent on the size of our fuel matrices, we have to be the centre of all of the fuel that's received, be at the centre to obtain those character traits and those residual benefits. Her narcissism drives her to be first. For a period of time it did not do so, whilst Harry was brought under and kept under control during the seduction of the golden period and his embedding as the intimate partner primary source. But now that he's in the sustained devaluation, not only does he have to put up with the behaviours that occur behind closed doors, he also faces the public relegation. And this article demonstrates again the failure by which many, many people operate in that they don't see that this is both unwelcome and what is actually happening. They see that there's a relegation, but they don't necessarily see it as a bad thing and they see it as something that actually he would rather like and support. What they fail to realise is that he's actually being humiliated, that he's being devalued, but he doesn't see it, and so many other people do not. But fortunately for all of you that listen to me, you can see it quite clearly for what it is. A continuing, subtle, but sustained part of the devaluation of Prince Harry. I'm H.G. Tudor. Thank you for listening.